Hello, Saints. I'm Arnett, and this is Zebulun, where truth lives, sharing the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters, also known as the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. I pray that all is well with you and yours uh, as we continue to work our way through the book of Revelation. Um, today, hopefully, we'll finish off Revelation 17. But without further ado, so without further ado, let's have a word of prayer and jump right into it. And we're going to just pick up right where we left off last time. <clears throat> Loving Father, Lord, we uh, sit in your school for you to teach us, teach us about salvation, teach us how we can become more Christ-like, teach us how we can be um, with you in e eternity, Father God, how we can be ready for your second coming. Teach us how to give glory to your name and to represent you rightly in the word, in the world. Speak to us through your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And last time, you remember, we closed with this statement, uh, which is a powerful statement. When faithful teachers expound the word of God, there arise men of learning with PhDs, ministers professing to understand the scriptures who denounce sound doctrine as heresy and thus turn away inquirers after truth. Were it not that the world is hopelessly intoxicated with the wine of Babylon, multitudes would be convicted and converted by the plain cutting truths of the word of God. But religious faith appears so confused and discordant that the people know not what to believe as truth. Ministers, pastors are not teaching the people what they need to know they should be teaching these things that we're learning here in Zebulun. And not only are they not teaching them, but those that are teaching them, they're calling it heresy. And they're causing many people to be um, confused and discordant. The sin of the world's impenitence lies at the door of the church. That's a powerful statement. Who are God's people? In the, in the Bible, they're described with different names. Um, God's people in Revelation 12, 13 to 15 are referred to as a woman. Let's look at that real quick. Revelation 13. Revelation 12. Verse 13 and 15. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman. So the woman is the church, and the serpent is Satan, which brought forth the man child. The man child is Christ. The church, the Jewish nation, brought forth the man child, Jesus Christ. And verse 15, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, after the church, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood, a flood of persecution during the dark ages. So the point here is that the God's faithful people are referred to as a woman. In Revelation 12, 17, God's people are called the remnant of her seed. Let's look at that, 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The seed of the woman is still the church. It's just the remnant is the descendants. 
of the church, which do what? In the last days, they keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. In Revelation 13, 7, God's people are called saints and the beast persecutes them. Let's look at 13, 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. That's the woman. That's God's people. And to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindred tongues and nations. And Revelation 17, God's people are referred to as saints and the martyrs of Jesus. 17 verse 6. And I saw the woman, this woman is the harlot. She's drunk with the blood of who? Of the saints. That's God's people. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, that's the church, God's people. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. These are all clearly referring to God's church. Ellen White applies Revelation 17, 6 to the career of the Roman Catholic papacy. The power that for so many centuries maintained despotic sway over the monarchs of Christendom is Rome. And no other power could be so truly declared drunken with the blood of the saints as that church which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Christ. Babylon is also charged with the sin of unlawful connection with the kings of the earth. So killing God's people and connecting with the kings of the earth, uniting church and state, civil power, first enforcing the church. Those are the two, um, those are two sins of Babylon. Now we're going to talk about the seven-headed scarlet dragon or serpent. John Andrews, perhaps the ablest scholar in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, had this to say about the three seven-headed beasts of Revelation 12, 13, and 17. All three of those chapters describe a seven-headed beast. The seven heads are seven forms of civil power. See, the harlot sits on the beast with seven heads. The harlot's an apostate religious power, and the seven heads are seven consecutive civil powers which successively bear rule one after the other not simultaneously each head takes its turn starting with babylon and ending with a, a, a papacy whose deadly wound has healed these seven heads belong alike to the dragon the dragon, the body of the dragon, is the peoples of the earth of Revelation 12, the beast of Re chapter 13, and that of Revelation 17. This shows conclusively that the dragon and these two beasts are symbols of the same power under different heads. So it's the same religious power ruling over different civil powers. For there are not three sets of seven heads, but it is evident that the heads are successive forms of its power, one of them bearing rule at a time, and then giving place to another. The proper period of each seems to be this, the dragon before 1260 years. So before the 1260, that's the reign of the papacy. So the dragon, uh, the head would be what? Pagan Rome. The beast of chapter 13 during that period of 1260 years, that would be papal Rome. 
And in the Beast of Revelation 17, is is Papal Rome after the deadly wound has healed. So those are three separate heads, is what Andrews is saying. And I agree with him. The seven heads of the dragon beast are also described as seven mountains. And see, Pastor Bohr is going to show you how they looked at uh, river serpents and river dragons in ancient times, the symbolism they used in their mind. In the Bible prophecy, mountains represent kingdoms, not individual kings. This means that the seven heads must represent seven kingdoms. For example, the first head doesn't represent Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar or Darius. It represents Babylon. And all of those kings ruled under Babylon. It's the kingdom, not the king. Now, let's talk about the river dragon. In order to comprehend the meaning of the seven-headed dragon upon which the harlot sits, we must first understand how the ancients perceived river dragons. In the mythology of, ancient, of the ancients, mountains were considered the heads of a great cosmic river or serpent dragon. Uh, let, let me see. Let's see here. If I can. Uh, if I can. <clears throat> okay. Now. You had. Um, a mountain and in that mountain you had snow and the snow melt created lakes and then the lakes flowed downhill following gravity in rivers. Okay. And in ancient time, they viewed this as the mountain. This was the head of the serpent. Uh, let's see, can I get a different color? Well, we'll keep it this color. This is the head of the serpent. We'll make two eyes. And then the river was his body twisting down through the mountain. And when the, the waters were the people under the control of the serpent. And these were persecuting waters. When the serpent was alive, when the kingdom was uh, persecuting, the serpent was alive. And when it lost its power to persecute, the serpent was dead. And when it persecuted, the waters would often overflow the banks of the river on either side. And they considered that like the wings of a dragon. So you have the mountains is the head, the, the headwaters. Even now we call it the headwaters of a river. And then the river itself is the body of the serpent. And then a flooding is the wings of the dragon. And these waters are the waters of persecution. When the waters are flowing, the saints are being persecuted. When the waters are dried up, the saints are not being persecuted. So 
that's just kind of a rough picture to help you envision what he's going to be talking about. So let's read it. In the mythology of the ancients, mountains were considered the heads of a great cosmic river serpent or dragon. According to their pre-scientific world, okay, this is this is just, uh, they didn't really think it was a real dragon, but this is what the symbolic symbolism was. The mountain heads would spew out waters. So the mountain head, out of its mouth, it would spew water. And the water would form the body of the serpent. Which would flow down and form a riverbed in the valley. As the river twisted and turned tortuously in the valley, it looked like the body of a great river serpent dragon. According to their pre-scientific view, when the river was at flood stage, it overflowed its banks and sprouted wings. Okay. This is at flood stage. It's overflooding its banks. And that was the serpent spreading, sprouting wings like a dragon. Now, let's look at Isaiah 8, verse 7 and 8, and you'll see some of this terminology used in Scripture. Isaiah 8. Verse 7 and 8. Now, therefore, this is describing the coming of the Assyrian invasion. So this river dragon is the Assyrians coming against God's people in a flood of persecution. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river. You see there? Strong and many, even the kings of Assyria. So the waters of the river represent what? The kings of Assyria, a persecuting power. And he shall come up over his channels. So he's going to, it's going to be at flood stage and go over all his banks. He's going to go over the, the banks of the river and sprout his wings. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. So the flood water is going to try to drown God's people. It's going to come up to their neck. And the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land. His wings is that flood. O Emmanuel. But we know it came up to the neck, and then God sent the an angel and slew 185,000 of the Assyrian army. But... Um, That's, a, that's how Isaiah described it. It is of the utmost important to keep in mind that Revelation 12, 15, and 16, and 17, 9, and 15 is drawing on this ancient concept. Let's look at Revelation 12, 15, and 16. And the serpent cast out of his mouth. Okay. So this serpent cast out of his mouth. Whoops. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood he was trying to drown the woman with the waters of persecution and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth and so the dragon cast a flood out of his mouth and in the earth swallowed up the waters and helped the woman to not be drowned. 
the earth, it was North America. How did the earth help the woman? How did North America help help the woman? Well, during the flood of persecution, during the dark ages, after the French Revolution, North America allowed a safe place for the pilgrims to come to get away from not only uh, the um, Catholic persecution, but pro the Protestant churches, the Church of England and some of the Protestant churches that were still daughters of the mother were persecuting the saints as well. And they came over on the Mayflower to North America to, um, and the earth helped the woman. The earth is, represents an unpopulated area and it swallowed up the flood of persecution by helping the woman. Let's look at Revelation 17, 15. I mean, 9 and 15, Revelation 17, 9 and 15. Verse 9, and you're going to see this again. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Seven heads, whoops are seven mountains, these mountains. The seven, the headwaters are in the mountains. And verse 15. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the whore sitteth on this mountain. I'm going to just put an H for whore. Actually, it's a W, isn't it? W, I'm going to just write it. W H O R E. The whore sitteth on the mountain. And controls this headwaters that's spewing out the persecution. And these are the peoples under the papacy, nations, kindreds, tongues. The body of the serpent is the peoples, the armies, the civil powers that do the bidding of the whore that's sitting on and controlling them. However, in Revelation, the river dragon takes on a symbolic meaning. The mountain heads symbolize kingdoms. So these heads represent kingdoms. These heads represent the whore is sitting on the, the head is the kingdoms of the earth and they control the people. The mountains symbolize kingdoms and the waters which is the body of the dragon represent, represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. It's important to understand that the nations, multitudes, tongues, and peoples actually form the body of the dragon beast. So this body of the beast is formed by the people of the nations that are doing the bidding of the whore or doing the bidding of the king who's under the control of the whore. The harlot, 
and this is the dragon and then you have false prophets this is the reason why the harlot is described as sitting on a scarlet beast as well as on the waters so the the harlot is sitting on us she's sitting on this beast but she's also sitting on the waters because the waters is the body of the beast <clears throat> In other words, the waters and the scarlet beast are interchangeable. The waters and the dragon are scarlet because they are filled with the blood of God's people. So the people So the waters, let's see, let me go back one more time. So the waters here and the body of the beast are the same thing. It's the peoples of the earth that are doing the bidding of the papacy. The reliability of this ancient view as it applies to Revelation 17 is seen in the fact that the seven heads are identified also as seven mountains. As we have already seen in antiquity, the mountains were conceived as the heads of a dragon beast so these mountains this mountain was considered the head of the dragon beast the headwaters it is crucially important to realize that while the heads and the mountains are spewing out waters the dragon beast is what alive when the heads and the mountains however cease to spew out waters like when the beast receives a deadly wound the dragon beast is dead thus the beast is alive or dead depending on whether the harlot is able to use the head to persecute god's people because remember the papacy is a union between church and state. If she's not, if the harlot, if the harlot is not sitting on these heads, then the beast is dead, the dragon is dead. And what happened in the French Revolution is the whore was severed and separated from civil power. And so she, the papacy received a deadly wound. The Catholic Church continued on, but it had no civil power. And so the beast was dead. The dragon was dead. The waters were dried up. Does that make sense? But when, she's, when she received civil power again, which is what apostate Protestantism is attempting to do now, when church and state come together, then the waters of persecution will flow again. Thus the beast is alive. Okay. That is to say, when the harlot commands the kings to order their multitudes to persecute God's people. See, see, the harlot commands the kings to order the people, the multitudes, to do what? To persecute God's people. So let's look at the picture. I picture's worth a thousand words to me. The harlot influences the kings to have the people persecute God's people. Then that's when the dragon is alive. When the civil powers uphold democratic principles and keep aloof from the church, the dragon beast is dead. That's why the dragon beast received a deadly wound in the French Revolution, but 
the earth helped the woman not only by giving a place for the pilgrims to come, but allowing a new nation to come up in 1776 with a constitution that kept church and state separate, keeping the dragon beast dead and keeping the waters of persecution from flowing. Here's some parallels between Revelation 12, 13, and 17. I'm not going to go turn there, but you can turn there in your Bibles. Maybe take a picture of this. By the way, you can get these notes by going to Sun TV and then download the notes. In Revelation 12 and 13, it talks about seven heads and ten horns. But like I said, in Revelation 12, the head is the is the uh, fourth head. In Revelation 13, it's the fifth head. In Revelation 17, it's the seventh head. The fourth head, in Revelation 12, King Herod, pagan Rome. Revelation 13, the beast during the Dark Ages, papal Rome. Revelation 17, the beast whose deadly wound is healed by apostate Protestantism, which is the sixth head, is the seventh head. Different heads, but they all um, ha have a harlot ruling over them. And they all have ten horns, which is represents their rulership over the kings of the earth. They all have the names of blasphemy, Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. They both talk about a woman the church. They both call for wisdom. They both uh, talk about nations, tongues, and peoples. They both talk about persecution. They both talk about the waters of persecution. They both talk about the waters being dried up. They both talk about uh, the beast that was during the 1260 per year period, is not when it received its deadly wound, and then shall be is when the deadly wound is healed. So the beast that was during the dark ages is not deadly wound shall be when the deadly wound is healed. And they both talk about, uh, well, Revelation 12 and 13 talk about the beast and the false prophet. But Revelation 17 describes the beast as the harlot and the false prophet as the daughters of the harlot. Three seven-headed beasts that we just looked at, Revelation 12, 13, and 17. The three seven-headed beasts originate in different places. When the seven-headed dragon attempted to slay the man-child, a sign was seen in heaven because it was a battle between Christ and Satan that originated in heaven, and Satan was cast out of heaven and a third of the angels were cast out with him. The seven-headed beast in Revelation, but, but I would say that the, that the head, the place for this head was Rome, not heaven. Because when Jesus was born, it was Herod who tried to kill him. The seven-headed beast of Revelation 13 arose from the sea, which was what? Europe, a populated area with a lot of people because it was heavily populated area. The seven-headed scarlet beast of Revelation 17 will arise from the abyss because the beast is resurrecting from the deadly wound. The abyss represents that it was dead, but it's coming back alive from its deadly wound. So it comes out of the abyss. Revelation 17 at 8. Let's look at let's look at 17 8 and talk about the abyss. The beast that thou sawest was during the dark ages and is not received its deadly wound and shall ascend 
out of the bottomless pit, the deadly wound will heal and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life. See, the, the people that make up the body of the serpent, their name is not in the book of life because they're persecuting God's people. <clears throat> when they behold the beast that was, is not, and yet is. And here's the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. The woman is sitting on that mountain and the river dragon flows down from it. The dragon of Revelation 17 ascends from the abyss and the abyss is the realm of the dead. Let's look at some scriptures for that. Romans 10, 7. Or who shall ascend into the deep? And the word for the deep in the Greek, let's look at Romans 10, 7. And let's look at it in the Greek. I want to see what does abyss mean in the Greek. Romans 10, shall I, or who shall I descend into the deep? What's the word for deep? Abusos. Abusos or abyss. All right. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Because Romans 10, 7, the context here. Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. So the abyss, abusos, the abyss is the realm of the dead. The word deep is abusos. In Revelation 20, verse 1, Satan is cast into the abyss with a deadly wound when he cannot use the rulers because they are dead. Satan comes up from the abyss. So when Satan, in Revelation 20, verse 1, let's look at that. And I saw an angel and I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. This bottomless pit is abusos, the abyss. So Satan is cast into the abyss, not because he's dead but because it's the realm of the dead. At the second coming of Christ, the wicked are slain and the righteous are taken to heaven and Satan is bound to this earth by a chain of circumstance. And it's the realm of the dead because all the people on earth are dead. So that's what it represents. Seven heads. Let's talk about the seven heads. Revelation 17 tells us that the seven heads represent seven kings. However, the word kings in Bible prophecy is interchangeable with kingdoms. You can look at these verses. I'm not going to look at it for time's sake. The seven heads are actually seven successive civil kingdoms that have ruled the world since Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. But it's not Nebuchadnezzar we're focused on, it's Babylon. The head is Babylon, not Nebuchadnezzar. It's the kingdom, not the king. Some have thought that Egypt and Assyria are the first two heads of the scarlet beast. And so they put it like this. The first head was Egypt, the second head was Assyria, the third head Babylon, the fourth is the Medo-Persia, the fifth Greece, the sixth Roman Empire, and the seventh Papal Rome and in the eighth papal Rome, either after its deadly wound or after the millennium. There's a little debate there. 
The problem with this concept is that Egypt and Assyria are not found in any of the lines of prophecy in Daniel and Revelation. Egypt does appear symbolically in Revelation 11, representing France, but there the beast from the abyss does not persecute God's people, but rather gives the fifth head a deadly wound. In Revelation 11, Egypt is a representation of um, of uh, what do you call it when you don't believe in God? I'm having a, a mental blight. Atheism. In Revelation 11, Egypt is a symbol of atheism because France was an atheistic power that wanted to get rid of God. Daniel 2, the gold, Daniel 7, the lion, and Revelation 13, the lion, all begin with Babylon, not Egypt or Assyria. So that's why that's not a good representation of the seven heads. Daniel 8 and 11 begin with the kingdom of Persia. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon is known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire. It is called so because it is a continuation of the Babylon that originated at the Tower of Babel. All false religions have their origin at the fountainhead of the Tower of Babel, with Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz, the false trinity. Because from there, humans spread out over the earth. And it all traces back to that first head, Babylon. That's why the end time power is called Babylon. Are the seven heads seven popes? I'm not going to go through all of this, but if you have the study notes, you can study it. Um, or you can take a picture of it. Uh, pause it and take a picture of it. In more recent times, some have thought that the seven heads represent seven successive popes who have ruled since 1929. Five have fallen since 1929. One, two, three, four, five. According to this scenario, the head who is, or the sixth head, would have been John Paul II, and the one who is to come would rule a short time was Benedict who served as Pope from 2005 to 2013. However, Benedict resigned and a papal chair, and now we have Francis, would supposedly be number eight. Um, but the heads represent kingdoms, not individual popes within the kingdoms. So it would look something like this. But before the election of Francis, evangelicals and even some Adventists had referred to a prophecy by St. Malachi to the effect that the next pope would be the last and that he would be black, which is a euphemism for a Jesuit pope, the black pope, and his name would be Petros Romanos. None of these things are true of Francis I. All of the, he, is, he is a Jesuit. All of this speculation detracts from the power of this prophecy. The fact is that this prophecy has nothing to do with individual popes. The seven heads are not seven individuals, but rather seven kingdoms. All this speculation about the seven heads should be discarded for the following reasons. First, it comes close to date setting. I'm, I'm not gonna go read all of that. Second, these speculative views sever Revelation 17 from the previous prophetic lines of Daniel 7, 12, and 13. As we have seen, 12, 13, and 17 are linked together. Ellen White understood the common thread between 12, 13, and 17 when she wrote this. God has warned his people of the perils before them. John beholds the things which will be in the last days, and he sees a people working counter to God. And then she wrote, read Revelation 12, 14, and chapter 17 and 13. She's linking them together. Third, although the seven heads and mountains of this dragon beast are said to be seven kings and the words kings and kingdoms are used interchangeably in prophecy, in prophecy, mountains represent kingdoms, not individual rulers. 
The popes on the list above are actually not rulers of seven distinct kingdoms, but rather leaders of the same kingdom. They're all of the same kingdom. Finally, there is little evidence that 1929 should be chosen as a beginning date for the sequence of the seven heads. As uh, he has clearly shown in another place, the deadly wound was not healed in 1929 because Revelation 13, 11 to 18 tells us that the United States will be inter- instrumental in healing the deadly wound, not Italy. In Revelation 13, it's apostate Protestantism that heals the wound, not Italy. The beast three stages. The beast from the abyss has three consecutive historical stages. It was, it is not, and it shall be in the future. It was, is not, and yet is, better translated shall be present. These same time periods are described as five are fallen, the past. That would be, let's just test it, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome during the Dark Ages. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. The time periods, the time periods are also explained as the beast who was and is not, even he is the eighth. Note the beast was dirt, the beast was, that's the twelve hundred sixty years of papal dominion is not because the beast present presently has a deadly wound and it shall be because the deadly wound will be healed and the whole world will wonder after the beast. It is to be understood from the perspective of the end times. The heads of the dragon beast do not rule simultaneously, but consecutively. The heads are wounded one by one as each civil power passes from the scene. We know this for two, for at least two reasons. First, archaeology. Okay, I'm gonna skip that part because that's second. Revelation 12:15 explains that only one mouth is spewing out persecuting waters at any given time. Further, Revelation 13, 3, 5, and 6 tells us that only one head of the seven-headed beast received the deadly wound. It didn't say all the beasts received a deadly wound. It's just the one that was ruling at that time received a deadly wound. The one that was ruling at that time spewed out of its mouth, not their mouths. So that shows you it's just one head at a time. The meaning of the seven heads. To the best of our knowledge, and I agree with um, this part here, The seven heads represent the following successive civil kingdoms that have have or will be allied with apostate religion, Babylon. And the religion back then was Mithra or Mithraism. The Medes and the Persians, Greece, Pagan Rome, the Roman Empire. Number five, Papal Rome. When the papacy was ruling over Europe, the nations of Europe. Number six, apostate Protestantism. And number seven, the civil powers of the entire world indicated by the ten horns who resurrect under the leadership of the harlot that who, that received a deadly wound and the deadly wound has now been healed. It will be, so, so it's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, apostate Protestantism, and then Rome resurrected. It will be observed that in this scenario, three of the last four heads of this scarlet beast are Roman. And even the number six, which is the United States, will become an ally of Rome because it will speak like a dragon and the dragon is a symbol of Rome. 
the question that begs to be asked is why would three or four of the seven heads relate to Rome? Isn't one head enough to represent the various stages of Rome? Here's why. The answer to these questions is quite simple. The book of Daniel and Revelation themselves take up the stages of Rome separately. Daniel 2, the legs of iron, are distinguished from the feet of iron and clay, which is the divided Roman Empire under Papal Rome, and the legs are pagan Rome, so it, it separates them. In Daniel 7, 23 and 24, we find a clear distinction between the dragon ruling with ten horns, that's head number four, pagan Rome, followed by the dragon with the little horn, that's horn, that's head number five, papal Rome. Revelation 13 adds that the little horn beast will have another stage after its deadly wound is healed, which is head number seven. However, Kingdom 6, the United States will be inter instrumental in giving head number 5 its power back. So 5 is pagan Rome, uh, papal Rome, 6 apostate Protestantism, which in Revelation 13 is a separate beast. You have two beasts. You have the sea beast, and then you have the beast that came out of the earth. They're two separate, 5 and 6. And then 6 will give power back to 5, which will become 7. The deadly wound healed. I know it's kind of confusing, but you gotta study it. Even further, Revelation 12 portrays dragon in heaven with ten horns as a symbol for pagan Rome, and Revelation 13 uses a composite beast from the sea with ten horns to represent papal Rome during the 1260 years, and Revelation 17 employs yet a third beast from the abyss with ten horns to represent the papacy when its deadly wound is healed. So the point he's making is the different phases of, of, of Rome, pagan Rome, papal Rome during the dark ages, papal, papal Rome with its deadly wound healed are all taken up separately in Daniel and Revelation. So that's why they're different heads. If three beasts which arise in three different places are used to represent different stages of Rome, then it should not surprise us that separate heads are used to depict those same stages. It is important to underline that the sixth head, the United States apostate Protestantism, is symbolized by a separate beast and is related to Rome because it speaks like a dragon and the dragon represents Satan working through Rome. He's talking about Revelation 13 right there. Ellen White clearly identifies the last three persecuting powers in their proper historical sequence. She underlines that when the heads persecute God's people, the heads are alive. Under the symbols of the great red dragon, the leopard-like beast, and the beast with the lamb-like horns, and the earthly governments, which would be especially engaged and trampling upon God's law and persecuting his people were presented to John. Their war is to be carried on to the close of time. The people of God, symbolized by a holy woman and her children, are represented as greatly in the minority. In the last days, only a remnant still exists. John speaks of them, of them as those that keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. So she took them up separately. What a, what did she how does she separate them? The great red dragon that would be pagan Rome. The beast with lamb like horns, apostate Protestantism. Yeah, I guess this leopard like beast would be the the papacy during the Dark Ages. Regarding the last head in the sequence, Ellen White has stated, as we approach the last crisis, it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist among the Lord's instrumentalities. 
The world is filled with storm and war and variance, yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. So she's describing the papal power that, that heals as one head. When the land which the Lord provided as an asylum for his people, that's the United States, or North America, I should say, that they might worship him according to the dictates of their own conscience, because the earth swallowed up the flood of persecution and giving them a chance to worship freely, the land over which for long years the shield of omnipotence has been spread. God's omnipotent hand has been over the United States. The land which God has favored by making it the depository of the pure religion of Christ. When that land shall through its legislators abjure the principles of Protestantism and give continence to Roman apostasy in tampering with God's law, it is then that the final work of the ban of sin will be revealed. In other words, when the United States goes against its constitution and allows church and state to come together and, and, and backs the Sunday law, the final work of man of the man of sin will be revealed. Protestants will throw their whole influence and strength on the side of the papacy by a national act enforcing the false Sabbath, which is Sunday worship. They will give life and vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, reviving her tyranny and oppression of conscience. Then it will be time for God to work in mighty power for the vindication of his truth. God is gonna work. Some have wondered about the eighth head. Let's see how far. Okay, you know what? I'm going to stop here because there's quite a bit more. I'm just going to have to do one more session on Revelation 17. And we'll stop right here. And we're going to talk about the uh, the eighth head. <clears throat> Where was I? Some have wondered about the eighth head. So we're going to stop here and then we're going to talk about the eighth head. Because it does talk about eight heads. Whoops. And uh, we'll pick this up next time. So we've covered a lot today, and we'll pick it up next time. Let's have, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, we pray that you would just help us to study, to show ourselves approved. Help us to internalize um, the book of Revelation, because you wrote it for a reason, to let your, your people know where they are in the flow of prophetic history, and that we can know... Um, what's happening in the world today that's going to overtake most people like an overwhelming surprise but your saints it will not be a surprise to us it will come as a thief in the night to them that are in darkness but the children of light will understand father god we just pray that you will continue to instruct us give us understanding help us to hold fast to the truth and let go of anything that's not uh that's error we pray in jesus name amen well, uh, we'll pick it up next time, saints, and we'll talk about the eighth head of this seven-headed beast. Well, it's really eight heads, but the eighth head is part of the seven. And uh, we'll study that next time. May God keep you and yours until then. <laughs>